Here are my top nine stocks to buy right now. In this video, we'll go over one stock that I own, followed by one stock I'm still researching. As we alternate our way up to a stock that's increased in value by $500 billion over the past year, but may have room to double again. As always, we'll start by putting my money where my mouth is by showing you my actual Charles Schwab stock portfolio. So here it is. We can see how over the past three months, it has increased in value by over $40,000, a 25% increase, but it hasn't all been smooth sailing. While it went up significantly, at the start of the year, if we go down to a one month view, it is up a little bit, but it peaked at $210,000 in early February. And since then it's dropped all the way down to $196,000. So a $40,000 rise in three months seems great, but then there's also a $14,000 drop in just a few weeks. And that's kind of what happens when you're investing in individual stocks. It is more risky. And stick around until the end to see a full list of all the stocks in my portfolio today. But first let's get into a stock that's made me over a 300% return in my portfolio over the two different times I invested in it. And it's a company that's redefining the cybersecurity space, CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike is an industry leading cybersecurity company. A few years ago, their whole thing was combining AI with cybersecurity, but nowadays that's nothing special. In order to protect against the ever increasing number of attacks, many of which are generated now using tools like generative AI, you need to have AI on the defense as well. And CrowdStrike is better at applying those tools than almost any other company on the planet. The company is ranked in the top right magic quadrant for endpoint protection by Gartner. They also have the world's leading AI native cybersecurity platform, and they are a cloud native cybersecurity platform, meaning as more and more companies move into the cloud, CrowdStrike is going to be one of their first choices for defending their platform. The company's stock price has increased by 164% over the past year, which is kind of crazy. But at the same time, the company is growing their revenue at 35% year over year, and they've been doing that consistently consistently for several quarters in a row, basically as long as I've been looking at them. On top of that, the company has recently become operating income positive, increasing 105% year over year. And while the company's last quarter did report that they had a negative net change in cash, the company on average is free cash flow positive, meaning they have money to spare to invest in buying back the stock if it drops too low, buy competitors, or invest in their product. CrowdStrike is one of those few companies that has an insane ability to execute, and as the triple threat trends of AI, cloud, and cybersecurity are all pushing it forward and it's growing faster than the industry, this puts CrowdStrike in a great position to continue to grow, which is why this company has grown to my largest position at $29,000 off of a $13,000 investment. So it's already more than doubled in this second time that I've bought it. And you'll see Charles Schwab gives it a D rating, but it's given it a D rating the entire time that I've owned it. And I think it's more of a valuation metric than a future growth metric. So I don't pay a ton of attention to those ratings. But next we'll shift to a stock that I don't yet own, but I have covered before, and anyone who bought it back when I covered it could have made as much as a 100% return in a couple weeks, which seems insane to say, but with this company, it's somehow true. ARM is an industry leading chip designer. They're kind of like Nvidia, only Nvidia designs and manufactures their chips, while ARM is solely focused on the design portion. Now, this means the company isn't gonna have quite as much revenue as a bigger company like Nvidia, but it also means they make a lot more margin on every dollar that they make, because they don't have to invest in expensive hardware and manufacturing equipment, they just have to come up with the designs. So they're selling information rather than physical chips. And the information that they're producing is extremely valuable. They reported record revenue of $824 million in their most recent quarter. And their chips are used in everything from mobile phones to the infrastructure that is running the latest AI models. If we look at ARM stock price, they've increased by 109% over the past year. But if we zoom in a little bit further, that entire increase happened in basically the span of a week, where the company jumped in price by 93% in just five days. They now sit at a current market cap of $135 billion, so still around a tenth the size of a company like Nvidia, but also a very large company in their own right. So here's kind of the investing thesis behind ARM. ARM is literally everywhere with their chips. They have 280 billion chips in everything from sensors to smartphones to servers, and they own the intellectual property for designing these chips. This means the company is able to pivot relatively quickly onto new designs that are going to work for whatever the latest needs are. 10 years ago, no one would have expected that we would need chips for running generational AI on your phone to adjust photos on the fly. And 10 years from now, who knows what chips will be needed for the latest in metaverse technologies and spatial computing. ARM has this unique ability to generate these designs and sell them out to all different companies, which gives them a massive impact on the overall market. 
The biggest potential threat that I see to ARM would be companies like Apple and Google starting to design and manufacture their own chips. Because if these companies are able to scale that large enough, it's going to limit ARM's ability to kind of get their chips into the latest and greatest technology. But at this point, it seems like they still have a massive market. They're growing at a reasonable pace with the company's revenue up 14% year over year, but they're also becoming much more profitable with their last 12 months of free cash flow up 63% year over year with a 41% non-gap operating margin, meaning a lot of the money they bring in goes straight to profit on the bottom line. So as the chip market grows, as the AI market grows, and as more and more companies become digital companies, their infrastructure is gonna run on someone's hardware designs and there's a good chance it's going to be ARMS. But next we're gonna shift gears a little bit, away from the hardcore software and chip space and into the FinTech space, with a stock that I own that's growing at 30% per year and yet is nearly the cheapest that I've ever seen it, SoFi. So for anyone who doesn't know, SoFi basically operates like three businesses in one. They have their financial services segment, which is like the SoFi app and SoFi Invest. This is how they capture new customers. Then they have their lending segment where they make most of their money. This is like the SoFi home mortgages and SoFi student loans. Lastly, they have their technology platform, which is the technology backbone that runs all of their other services and has even gotten to the point where it runs other company services as well. Galileo famously helps run Robinhood, which is one of SoFi's competitors. SoFi stock price hasn't had a great start to the year with the stock down 15% and over the last one year the stock is only up 25% while a lot of fintech stocks have gone up substantially more than that and we can see the company's basically been trading sideways since last summer but what's interesting is while the stock price hasn't been going up the company has continued to grow we can see how over the last year they've increased to over seven and a half million members up 44% year over year and their number of products sold is up 41% year over year and because financial services services is growing even faster than their lending segment. That's like growing a funnel basically, which will eventually funnel down all of these cheaply acquired SoFi Invest and SoFi Money customers into more valuable areas of the company like lending, which means a lot of SoFi's revenue is yet to be realized. And on top of that, if we look at SoFi's price to sales ratio, we can see how it's changed over time. In 2021, it was sitting at 19 before dropping down to a current price to sales ratio of just over four, which is nearly the cheapest it's ever been in the company's history. And as long as SoFi's stock price continues to stay flat while the company itself grows, their price to sales ratio, which is just the market cap divided by revenue, will continue to drop because their revenue is just continually growing. In fact, it was up 34% year over year in the most recent quarter. And just one thing I wanna point out with this stock in particular is they're moving at a rate that is very unusual for a bank. When you think of most banks, they tend to be a little slow and plodding and they're not super innovative. SoFi is taking a very different approach. Their goal is to be the most consumer focused bank in the world. They want to make their customers lives actually better. And we can see that with how quickly the company has been acting on their roadmap. In January, they received five banking awards. In February, they celebrated one year of the SoFi checking and savings account. In March, they started offering FDIC insurance and were named to Fast Company's annual list of the world's most innovative company. They then acquired a mortgage company, launched a travel service built into their company. They even launched student loan verification and a face of finance marketing campaign. Every month they've continued to launch new products or reach the top of a different ranking. And recently they were even trusted with ARMS IPO. The company we just talked about went public via SoFi. And so as long as SoFi just continues doing what they're doing over a five to 10 year time horizon, I don't really see an outcome where they're not worth substantially more than they are today, which is how I like to invest. And by the way, if you enjoy these stock breakdowns, you may also enjoy FinTech Circle, which is linked below this video. FinTech Circle is basically like my Patreon where I host weekly stock breakdowns where I actually review a stock with you on the call. I post all of my trade decisions in near real time, such as when I bought 65 more shares in SoFi in early February, along with an immediate brain dump of what I'm thinking when I make that decision, so you can help learn from it. And most importantly, it's a growing community of investors who want to build long-term wealth through investing instead of just focusing on the latest hype. Plus it comes with all these other great perks like a free investing course, a weekly summary of the market, and of course the ability to message me whenever you want. I can't promise you I'll respond immediately, but I do respond to every message. You can sign up using the link in the description and get a discount if you sign up for a yearly membership to help support content on this channel. Okay, now on to the next stock, which is another FinTech company that's actually even cheaper than SoFi, whose new CEO has promised to completely revitalize the way the company runs, PayPal. Now most people have probably heard of PayPal. They're the company that basically single-handedly invented the idea of 
spending money over the internet. But nowadays, they offer much more than that. They're a payment processor for businesses to transact with their customers. They include some massive companies like Spotify, Sony, and Netflix. And of course, they still have their personal business where customers can purchase products directly through them, they can send money to each other, and they even offer services like their own credit card. At the same time, PayPal's been kind of a boring business for the last two decades. Most of their growth has been from acquiring smaller companies and kind of bolting them on, which has led PayPal to become a very big company, yes, but also one that moves relatively slowly and isn't known for being particularly innovative. If we look at their stock price, the company has only increased in price by 68% over the last almost a decade at this point. And while the company had a major run up in price in 2021, the stock price is down over 80% since then. And when we look at their earnings, it's kind of a similar story. The company makes a ton of revenue over $7 billion, but you know, they're growing 6%, 8%, 7%, 8% again. Their net income is dropping one quarter. It's a company that makes a lot of money, produces a lot of cash, but they're not a company that you expect to suddenly double in price overnight. But that might be changing. PayPal has brought in a a new CEO, Alex Chris, who formerly worked at Intuit, which is involved in companies like TurboTax and QuickBooks. And his goal, which I talked about in my previous monthly update, is to drive growth at PayPal without losing profitability. He wants to consolidate down, focus the company's vision, and point them in a new direction to continue to grow. Now, that being said, I don't expect them to see any major changes over the next few quarters. It'll take some time for the CEO to make changes. But given how exciting their last earnings call was, there is a a very real possibility that PayPal could become a turnaround stock and go from a company that only has a $62 billion market cap to one that crosses the $100 billion mark and beyond. After all, the other companies that started around the same time as them are now worth a lot more than $100 billion. But now moving back to another stock that I currently invest in, and reminder that at the end of the video, I'll show every stock in my portfolio. But next up, we have a company that's reinventing the future of work itself, Monday.com. Monday is growing their revenue at just under 40% year over year while actually producing a profit and producing positive free cash flow in their most recent quarter. This is a company that focuses on improving the way that people work together. They have a platform that can be used for creative design work, software development, marketing, project management, all different ways of interacting with your team remotely or on site. But as we enter a world where more people work in distributed workforces, maybe you have people in New York, maybe some people on the West Coast, maybe some people in Chicago, and maybe some people people in Europe, you have to have some kind of unifying system that connects them all together. Monday.com does that by continually inventing new ways to make people more efficient as they work together. They're calling this work OS, which kind of gives you an idea of their total ambitions. They want to be the operating system that runs your work itself. And because the kinds of customers who use products like Monday.com tend to be businesses, their customers are very sticky because there's a lot of opportunity costs for switching off of Monday.com and onto a new platform. The company currently has 225,000 customers, a dollar-based net retention rate of 110%, and 2,000 customers with over $50,000 in annual recurring revenue. So it's still a relatively small company that has room to grow from here. And the fact that Monday.com has a positive dollar-based net retention rate means they have growth built into the company. So imagine if the company sold $100 million worth of product this year. Well, next year, they can expect to have $110 million worth of revenue without selling any new customers customers at all. That is a crazy metric, especially when you add advertising on top of that. Now, Monday.com does have some risks in that they're a relatively small company and there is competition in the space, which is why this isn't my largest position. And I currently own 70 shares in the company at a valuation of just under $15,000. So it's made me just under $3,000 in total. And you can see that Charles Schwab doesn't actually have a rating for this company, maybe because it's on the smaller side, but I'm still confident enough to make this a mid-sized position. Turning now to one of the most mysterious companies that operates in the public market, we have Palantir. Palantir is a company that makes most of their income in industries that don't really like to share information with other people. Banking, medicine, the military, and secret government organizations all count Palantir as a service provider. Now the company has three basic products and one new product, which we'll talk about. The first product is Foundry, which is what they call the ontology powered operating system for the modern enterprise, which to simplify that down, basically means how customers store their data 
in a way that they can get useful insights from it. Palantir has a platform that lets these companies, especially companies and organizations with very sensitive data, to be able to extract insights from that data like any other company would. And Palantir kind of does this by operating almost as a half consulting firm, half software platform. They have really expensive engineers go onto the ground, tinker with the systems, and set them up so that companies can use it. This means Palantir is unbelievably sticky once they're in place because it was expensive to get them there, but it also makes their sales cycle a little bit longer, which is one of the reasons I didn't invest in this company in the past. Their next product is Gotham, which is what they call the operating system for global decision making. Gotham is effectively the dashboard that allows everyone to run their companies. If you're running a complex organization like the military, for example, data analytics can massively speed up your decision making and let you know what is happening in real time in different areas of the world. Or if you're running a bank, having advanced analytics can help spot cybersecurity threats, fraud, or opportunities for new investments. Lastly, they have Palantir Apollo, which is about deploying software into areas where it's normally not too easy to. It might be easy for Google to push an update to Google Chrome, but how do you push an update to someone who's operating in the middle of the ocean or a secret location somewhere in the desert? This is one of the reasons that Palantir is considered really valuable by secretive organizations like the US government. But while they've had all these products for a while, these products alone don't explain why Palantir's stock price has increased by 188% over the past year, with the stock seeing two massive jumps, the first one increasing by 100%, and then the second one recently increasing their stock price by an additional 50%. And the big difference maker here is AIP, which is what they describe as activating the full spectrum of AI in days and driving enterprise operations. You can basically think of this like generative AI applied to data. Now I mentioned before that one of the big issues with Palantir is it's really expensive to get set up with them. You have to get all your organization's data into a nice cleaned up organized way that Palantir can then extract insights from. AIP allows them to start extracting these insights immediately because with generative AI, it can just go and read that Word document that you had, or it can pull together a bunch of PDFs into a vector database and then answer questions on that. The company is now focusing on launching these AIP boot camps where they can go from zero to actual use cases in a matter of days, which solves, in my opinion, what was the biggest issue with the company, onboarding. Now that they can get customers onto the platform quickly, because the platform's already very sticky, that just accelerates the rate at which Palantir is able to grow. And if we look at the company's latest earnings report, we're kind of seeing exactly that. Their US commercial revenue grew 70% year over year and up 12% in just three months, with their overall revenue growing 20%, and they closed over 103 deals worth over a million dollars, which is double what it was a year ago. The company is also making a ton of free cash flow of $305 million with 50% margin, so half of their earnings go straight to cash. And this is their fourth consecutive quarter of gap profitability at an 11% margin. Now, I may have my gripes with the company's CEO and how flashy he is, but you can't deny that the company has started to execute on the vision that they've laid out all along. And I think with generative AI, they've ended up in a really strong position where some very secretive organizations only trust Palantir to use these latest tools on their data sets, which is what I would call a competitive moat and a reason to potentially invest. But now let's move out of the heavily US focused companies and move into a little known Brazilian fintech stock that many US investors are overlooking. Seeing as this company is single-handedly bringing Brazil up to and maybe even surpassing the US's banking market. Nubank is the fintech stock of Brazil, which is a company that has been investing aggressively into their financial system. The company's president announced a $200 billion infrastructure plan, which would go to areas such as infrastructure, energy, and transportation over a four year period. And this is just the tip of the iceberg for the types of investments that Brazil has been making in their economy. Now, one of the companies that has benefited from Brazil's focus on trying to make their economy more competitive on the world stage is Nubank, a fintech stock that offers everything you would expect from a fintech. They have credit card transactions, they have savings accounts, they have an app where you can manage all of your financial services in one place. While the story is one we've heard many times before, what's interesting about this company are the numbers. The company says they're the world's largest digital banking platform, surpassing platforms like WhatsApp Pay, Google Pay, and Apple Pay to hitting 90 million users in October of 2023, with 83% of those users active every single month. It's not often that you see a company that has increased their number of customers by 18.7 million in a single year. Now, at the same time, because the company is operating in Brazil, their average customer value is going to be lower than a company like SoFi, but the company still had a 53% revenue increase to $2.1 billion, 
sales and a gross profit of $914 million with net income of $303 million, meaning the company is profitable. And if we look at the company's growth rate from Q3 of 2021 through now, the company has 4 x in size over basically two years. Now, the way Nubank basically puts together their strategy is they want to offer the best products and experiences they can, which brings on more customers, which means that as they get bigger, they can gather more data, they can reduce costs, which allows them to offer fees and services that attract more customers, which again makes them grow. This is basically just the virtuous cycle of having a product that customers actually want to use. And while it by itself isn't anything that special, the fact that so many customers are using the platform shows that it's actually working. Now, the big question for Nubank is how effectively will they be able to expand outside of Brazil? In Brazil, they have a very friendly government, which is willing to help them with things, but the financial services market is one that is notoriously regulated and often very political. So it'll be interesting to see if the company can successfully expand into areas such as Mexico and eventually perhaps the US and Europe. I currently own 1,220 shares in Nubank valued at just over $12,000 and it's basically flat for me. It's made around $1,000 overall. But next up, we have the stock that I've invested more money into than any other stock that I've ever owned. Because it sits at the intersection of three trends of data, AI, and digital transformation. And that company is Datadog. Now, when I say digital transformation, basically the theory goes like this. 20 years ago, there wasn't really the concept of a tech company. You had some early options like Amazon and Google, but they were mostly small fry compared to the big companies like the Walmarts and the Exxon Mobiles of the world. But nowadays, a lot of big companies are just tech companies. And even companies like Amazon, which is more like a logistics and shipping company, is considered a tech company because they use tech effectively. So in 20 years, I don't think a company like Amazon would be considered a tech company because every company will run like Amazon or like a modern tech company, or they'll be out of business. You simply won't be able to compete with companies that are using the latest tools like generative AI, distributed computing, advanced analytics, and you'll be outcompeted by other tech companies. And so as we see this trend start to unfold, one company that benefits from that is Datadog. Datadog's stock price is up 66% over the past year to a current market cap of $43 billion. So it's still a pretty small company. What Datadog does is unite a company's applications, their infrastructure, and their security all through a single pane of glass. So once the company is on their platform, their leaders can basically look at a single dashboard and understand what's happening in the company. This means that Datadog makes their customers more money than it costs them. And so one of the only areas to a company using Datadog is if they're not able to get their data organized enough for Datadog to be useful. If everything's written on handwritten pieces of paper, it's probably not that useful. But with the advent of generative AI, like we talked about with Palantir, that could be a huge boost to Datadog. But while that's a nice story, Story, we really need to look at the numbers to see if it's actually true. Datadog's fourth quarter revenue grew to over half a billion dollars, up 26% year over year. And they now have 396 customers who spend over a million dollars with them in annual recurring revenue, up from 317 a year ago. Now, annual recurring revenue is not quite the same thing as revenue. Revenue is just how much money you make in a given year. Annual recurring revenue is like a subscription. It's how much money you have that will roll over each year. So let's say I have a choice between two businesses. One makes a million dollars in annual recurring revenue selling software. Well, if I want this business to grow 50% next year, it just has to sell $50 million and the other 100 million just carries over from the previous year. But on the other hand, let's say I have a physical products business that sells $100 million worth of crackers. Well, if I want to grow 50% next year, I have to sell $150 million worth of crackers, which is why so many companies are going for the subscription revenue model. You probably see it all over the place, but it's also why as investors, annual recurring revenue is such a valuable thing to have. And perhaps most importantly, Datadog is making a ton of free cash flow, $598 million in the past year. And in my opinion, this is even more important than net income or what people call profit. Because with cash, you have options. As long as you have cash, the company can't ever really go out of business. But it is theoretically for a company to go bankrupt while being profitable. Imagine I buy a house for $100,000. Probably not happening in the US right now. Let's say I buy a house and it increases in value by $50,000. But while it's been increasing in value, I haven't been making any money and so I have to declare bankruptcy and I lose the house. Even though I technically made a $50,000 profit, it isn't useful unless I can actually get access to it. Now imagine I have a house that's $100,000 and it's being rented out and makes $50,000 a year. That is cash flow that I can actually use to help pay for food and pay off debts. And especially when you're in an economic downturn, cash is king. But don't take my word for it. Warren Buffett defines intrinsic value as the discounted value of cash that can be taken 
out of a business during its remaining life. Fundamentally, cash is the best metric for determining a company's value and profit's another good metric, but it isn't the only one to focus on. But next up, we have a stock I'm super excited about. This is one of the most innovative companies of all time, and it's an absolute behemoth that added $500 billion to their market cap over the past year. And that company is Google. Now, Google's stock price has increased by around 60% over the past year to a current market cap of $1.8 trillion. And the reasons for that mainly lie in Google's earnings. In the past year, the company grew their revenue to $76.5 billion, up 11% year over year, while their net income increased 41% over that same time period. And if we go into even more detail, they made $48 billion from Google search, $9.2 billion from YouTube ads, and very importantly, $9.19 billion from Google Cloud, which finally has a positive contribution profit for the company, meaning they're not just investing money into Google Cloud, it's actually bringing money back to them. Now, Google Cloud, for anyone who isn't familiar, is basically Google's service for other people to run applications on their servers. Let's say I wanted to build a mobile app. I could set up my own server and, you know, launch it on the App Store and have everybody connect back to my server. But what if the app suddenly takes off and has a million users? I can't just keep plugging in servers really quickly and hope that I have enough to support everyone. Instead, you deploy your app onto someone else's cloud network, like Google's. This allows you to take advantage to the thousands and millions of servers that Google has available to scale up and scale down as needed and only pay for what you need. You also get access to exclusive services that the company builds for their customers, including Google's suite of generative AI tools. And this is the reason that I think Google might be able to double in price from here. And I'm not just saying that, I'll show you the actual numbers. So Google recently launched their latest generation model, Gemini 1.5. Gemini is what they launched to basically compete with ChatGPT. It's their generative AI solution that lets you do everything from generate Shakespeare poems to understand images to even write code for you. They also have tons of other models as well like Imogen which allows them to generate images similar to GPT-4 with OpenAI. Now let's be clear Google has not yet caught up with OpenAI and ChatGPT in terms of all the latest AI that they're launching but they do seem to be closing the gap. There was a six month period when ChatGPT came out when it looked like Google was caught completely unaware. They didn't have any offering and they launched Bard, which was okay. But now with Gemini, they actually seem to have some level of parity with something like GPT-4. Of course, as soon as they do that, OpenAI comes out with Sora, which allows you to create a video directly from text. But I wouldn't be surprised if it takes less than six months for Google to catch up this time, because they are closing the gap between them and OpenAI. Now, you can't invest in OpenAI directly. They're a private company. But if you wanted to, you could invest into Microsoft, who's their biggest partner and owns something like 30% of the company. So let's see what Microsoft is worth. Microsoft's market cap is currently sitting at over $3 trillion. And part of that is due to high revenues they have from their enterprise agreements. But a lot of it has to do with their exclusive partnership with OpenAI. Having access to these tools makes your company incredibly valuable. And considering Google is currently sitting at a market cap of just over half of Microsoft's, if Google is able to catch up or even surpass Microsoft in their future AI tools, there's no reason to think that their market cap couldn't pass them as well. Especially considering Microsoft is currently sitting at a much higher price to earnings ratio than Google is. And as promised, here's my entire current stock portfolio. Subscribe if you want to make stock YouTube more transparent or you want more overly enthusiastic stock reviews. Bye!